I want to have a conversation with you about what it means to both implement and put into practice a legitimate HASCOM program. First off, how many of you heard that term for the first time and struggled to make sense of it? You may have heard it a dozen other times before, but it's never meant much to you. Don't stress, because I'm gonna break this down very simply. HASCOM is literally short for hazard communication. Still lost? That's okay. Hazard communication literally means how your employer communicates the hazards of chemicals and substances to you and your teammates, as OSHA requires. And before we get too deep, it's important I note that this applies to all of you. Whether you're a secretary, a project manager, or an engineer, this absolutely applies to you. If you ever work around or come near gasoline, bleach, WD-40, paint, oils, ammonia, or acetone, this applies to you. So basically what I'm trying to say, not so subtly, is that you can't escape the fact that this is applicable to you and your teammates. So please pay attention and share with anyone and everyone you know within your organization because they too are affected by this. Now, that being said, there are three topics I want you to be aware of that deal with the hazard communication of chemicals and substances. Number one is showing you what tools are provided to you through the new Global Harmonized System, otherwise known as GHS. Number two is learning where to find the critical hazard data of a specific substance and the fairly recent global change from the MSDS format to the SDS format. And finally, number three, ensuring you're doing all of the right things at your office, shop, or in the field to protect yourself from these very real and dangerous hazards. The Global Harmonized System is not new, but it's now an OSHA requirement as of 2015 by all manufacturers and suppliers of chemicals and hazardous substances. Dating all the way back to 1992, global leaders within the United Nations realized there was a great need to get every country and every language on the same system with hazardous chemicals, and therefore increase the likelihood of success when it comes to handling dangerous goods on a global scale. As you can imagine, if your company received a hazardous product made in China, you're gonna want those hazards very clearly spelled out in English, as well as use the same pictures and format you're accustomed to to notate the types of hazards you're dealing with, right? Yes, uh, of course you want that. So let's make an association that I think will, will help all of you understand where this is headed. How many of you remember the little green poison control guy named Mr. Yuck? He looks like this. He was created back in 1971 for the very same reasons we're talking about here. Poison Control wanted a consistent, marketable symbol that when seen, would immediately associate a high level of hazard to whatever product might pose a poison hazard. Now, that was more of a message for the general population, but the GHS system we've just been discussing is primarily geared towards those in the workplace. Within this GHS model, they provide nine different hazard classes and pictograms to help you almost immediately pinpoint the hazard you're dealing with. Let me walk you through these nine very quickly so that when you see them on a product you're working with, you can quickly identify the probable hazards that exist. Number one is this little exploding ball. And this of course is making you aware that your product has the necessary makeup to be explosive and possibly self-reactive. Number two, is this double flame, which simply notes the product is flammable and may also be self-heating and emit flammable gas when it contacts water. Number three is also a flame, but you'll notice the single flame on the outer part of the O. This means the product is an oxidizer, which in very simple terms means that it can interact with other products and compounds to create a combustion or explosion hazard. Number four is a combustible tank that often carries some type of gas, oxygen, or acetylene. When these gases are under pressure, they can explode, and therefore the obvious hazard. Number five is a pictogram of two little beakers showing burning and corrosion on both metal and skin. I love this one because they kill two birds with one stone. Because if a chemical can melt metal, I know this is a big shocker, but it's also gonna melt your skin and bone. Unless, of course, your X-Men's Wolverine, but you ain't no Wolverine. Sorry to break that to you. All right, number six, we've got an exclamation mark that notes when serious eye damage could occur or also some type of skin, eye, or lung irritation. This may be one of the lesser of the dangers, but it's still a hazard nonetheless. Number seven gets nasty. If you ever see this star-like symbol on the silhouetted person's chest, 
you know you're dealing with something very, very serious. I can't tell you how many times we see products being used with the, this pictogram and the ones handling it have absolutely no idea just how dangerous it is. This one symbol alone can mean you're in danger for serious respiratory issues, cancer-causing agents, germ cell mutagens, toxins that attack your, your uh, reproductive system, aspiration hazards, and even targeted organ toxicity. Yeah, that's all this one single pictogram. Okay, moving on to the worst of the worst, we have number eight, which is the classic skull and crossbones. Understand that this isn't some Disney picture associated with some silly pirates. When you see this, your life is in danger and you have to educate yourself on how to properly work around products containing these acute toxins. Death and serious illness is a very real possibility with products that have this picture. Number nine gets a final honorable mention because it has less to do with human dangers and more to do with fish and wildlife dangers as seen in this belly up fish and sad looking tree right next to it. These are products that you have to use extra care with when you're working outside and disposing of for both OSHA regulations and EPA standards. How many of you have heard of material safety data sheets, otherwise known as MSDS sheets? Most of you probably have, and if you haven't, you're about to have some knowledge dropped on you. So get ready. Material safety data sheets were the long time written accompaniment of every chemical and substance that posed some sort of hazard to those handling them. They were documents that somewhere in them, you would find a series of information, including the product name, its ingredients, the health precautions, the first aid to use in case of exposure, and several other things. All good stuff, right? Yes, but the issue was that there was no real structure to these documents. This information just had to be found somewhere in the document and each supplier could choose where they put it. So their purpose of informing and oftentimes quickly informing those exposed fell far short because of this lack of structure. Then enters safety data sheets otherwise known as SDSs. Within this GHS system we've been discussing, the SDS model has replaced the SDS model and has done so for the very reason we just discussed, structure. The SDS format is made up of 16 sections. Every single product must follow this same 16 section format. Now, in order to keep you fully engaged in this part of the training, I'm gonna highlight a few of the important ones so you understand what I'm talking about. Section three will always have the product ingredients. If you notice some ingredients that sound dangerous, they probably are. Look them up. Section four, and this is important in case of exposure, will always have the information for first aid measures. It will tell you what to do in case you get it in your eyes, on your skin, inhale it, or ingest it. First aid is section four. Okay, section 11 works in conjunction with this section and provides the toxicological information on the likely routes of exposure and both acute and chronic effects you could expect. And there's often some nasty stuff in that section, so check it out. Section seven will always give you directions on how to properly handle and store the product. And finally, section eight will always provide you exposure controls and PPE recommendations. Of course, we only hit a few, but it's imperative you get a hold of the SDSs of every product you're working with and get to know these sections. The more you're aware, the more likely you are to protect yourself and ensure accidental exposure isn't an issue for you. And let me say this, just because someone has worked around a harmful substance for a long time without taking safe measures and appears to be okay from our vantage point, that means absolutely nothing. Many products erode you from the inside out and it can take years to see the horrible effects some people allow to go unchecked. You need not look any further than tobacco use. Most of these products aren't killing you quickly, they're slowly killing you. Educate yourself and be sure you have an SDS book available at your office with all of the hazard, hazardous products you work around, even something as basic as bleach. Be sure your SDS book or electronic system has a usable structure, and preferably it's organized by department and has a table of contents that is quickly accessible to a full list of all chemicals found at your location. Be sure you talk to your supervisor about where this book is and what you might be exposed to. Having this for you and your team is pretty imperative. Since we didn't cover every section of the SDS, please remember that you can reach out to me or one of my consultants with any questions you might have on this topic. That's a substantial part of this service.
So we've talked about the new GHS model, your product suppliers are required to provide you and how they're trying to help you know the hazards more clearly through pictograms, as well as the new 16 section format of SDSs. Now it's important we discuss realistic ways you can protect yourself. The first one we've already alluded to, and that's checking those sections of the SDS sheet that relates to the ways in which a product can enter into your body, and then either eliminating the exposure altogether through engineered controls, or at a last resort, protecting your body against all of the known paths of entry with the recommended PPE. Number two is also very important and probably one of the greatest downfalls we see in most work environments. Failing to properly communicate hazards when a product has been moved from its original primary container to multiple secondary containers that no longer communicate the hazards the same way the primary container did. In other words, you take a large container of bleach and pour it into a bunch of smaller bottles to be used at various workstations and now you have a bottle with no label and nothing pointing to the real exposure hazards of bleach. The problem with not labeling secondary containers is that you will likely have multiple secondary containers of a number of different products. It could be Windex, alcohol, acetone, oil, gas, water, bleach, and the list goes on and on. How can you guarantee you know what you're working with? And better yet, maybe you know, but are, are, are these hazards being communicated effectively to anyone new that comes into your work area? No, not at all. Now, I threw water in there because how would you know the difference between water and something like bleach when it's in a spray bottle? Would you handle it differently? What about when someone is trying to find out what you just inhaled and how to help you after it caused you to pass out and they can't find a product name on the secondary container you were using? Does this make sense? Can you understand why it's called Hazcom? You always need to ensure the hazards are being communicated effectively. It's a human right to know what hazardous substances you and your teammates are working around, so always ask the question, does this bottle or this container communicate the hazards to everyone, or at a minimum tell us what product it is? At the very least, go grab some duct tape, uh, wrap it on the bottle or container and with a big black marker write the name of the product on there. Then ensure you are educated on the hazards of that product, preferably through some training or research in the SDS book. And let me also add this, when the bottle gets oily and greasy and the duct tape falls off, or the marker starts to fade away, slap another label on there. You owe it to yourself and your entire team to follow this structure and always lean more towards over communicating these hazards than letting them literally fade with the label that was once there. Also remember for those of you in the field, you also have the right to know what chemicals you're working near and ensure you have a plan to be near them. One, that you have done some preventative work beforehand to identify the hazards that might exist, but also coming prepared with any PPE that might be required. And please know that we care about each one of you. This training impacts you individually and with the ever increasing list of hundreds of thousands of harmful products out there, you need to know how to protect yourself. Please reach out with any questions you might have. Again, we want the best for you and your teammates and we want you to be safe. I'll see you in the next training.